Gidarlo. Hello, everyone. Nice to have you with us. Uh, we trust you and your loved ones are well and safe during these unsettling times. On behalf of uh, everyone on the organizing team for the 25th Global Forum, Chantal, Carl, and Michelena, and yours truly, a very warm welcome to all of you thirsty learners and open sharers, all of you Global Forum community colleagues and friends. As you know, we rescheduled the 25th Global Forum at MIT to next year, at the same time, same station. In the meantime, many of you suggested that we continue sharing and learning virtually together throughout the year so as to enrich our face-to-face -face experience and presentations and discussions in 2021. The topics that we'll be discussing for the, are the same as the ones that we'll be talking about in, at the 25th Global Forum, namely around the theme of the future. We'll be looking at the big picture in these virtual sessions, the why and how of strategic geopolitical, economic, societal, industry and company transformations, leadership and learning. In response to your suggestions, the Global Forum organizing team has organized a series of virtual and informal discussions that we are calling by a long name, Virtual Action Learning International Discussions or VALID. I think a better and easier way to remember that long title. These virtual discussions are with Global Forum community members and presenters are those who are, have volunteered to share their experiences and perspectives, their practices and recent publications. We are delighted that Drew Boyd, best-selling author, marketing, innovation thought leader, practitioner, consultant, and now professor, and always a great friend, colleague, and Global Forum regular, has volunteered to kick off the first of many Global Forum virtual discussions with a presentation on creative lessons from a pandemic. I was reminded about creativity and how important it is for our times when reading a new book entitled, See More, Act Faster, How Vigilant Leaders Thrive in an Era of Digital Turbulence by George Day and Paul Shoemaker, suitably published by MIT Press, in which they write and quote, that there is a premium for creativity when navigating new terrains with unexpected undercurrents. We can certainly add that this observation about creativity is even more critical in our extraordinary new terrains and undercurrents that we all face with this pandemic and its impact on our societies and businesses throughout the world. As usual, Drew, you are ahead of your time and we are very pleased that you are with us today to share your insights. Over to you, Lindarlo. Great, all right. Well, thank you very much, Yuri and uh, Darla, thanks for all your help in setting things up. Michelena, you as well. Uh, let me go ahead and start to share my screen here. And um, Yuri, I just want to confirm, if you wouldn't mind, confirm that you see my first slide. Okay, good. Well, <laughs> don't fear failure. Fear of being in the exact same place next year as you are today. You know, I found this quote, uh, the, it's, the, the author of this is unknown, but this comes from many years ago. God only knows how long uh, this was conceived, and it seems so appropriate, you know, for us today, given where we are. Uh, and what's, what the backstory is here is that when the pandemic started, when we started to really under, understand the uh, seriousness of the situation around mid-March, I uh, started a little side uh, note-taking and I titled it affectionately, you know, Creative Lessons About to be Learned Here. Because I've, I've noticed over my uh, career and over my, um, especially in, involved with creativity and commercialization, anytime there's a significant shock to a system, chances are you're going to learn something from it. Chances are there's going to be an unintended, a series of unintended consequences that hold lessons for us. Uh, things that we can see that we, we didn't predict going forward, but in hindsight, we can look at and go, oh yeah, I, I see that ha has happened. And those lessons to me are, are golden because they give us uh, the opportunity going forward to learn. And really, folks, when you think about it, isn't that, after all, the theme of the, the Global Forum? Isn't, isn't the Global Forum a 
a wonderful community of practice that believes in the, the mantra, learn at a rate faster than the rate of change. And this is a uh, paradigm that I learned from Yuri, and I really embrace it in my um, every part of my life. So in taking notes about creative lessons in a pandemic, I, I shared that idea with Yuri, and he invited me to be with you today, and I'm really pleased uh, to see so many familiar names as well as so many new names. It's too bad we couldn't be with each other this uh, uh, year in Boston, but I'm sure knowing the Global Forum that uh, we will make up for it <laughs> come next year and uh, uh, certainly get uh, all that um, is coming to us with the, the warm camaraderie and friendship and sharing that, um, that the, the Global Forum is known for. Just great to be with you and, and um, uh, see so many familiar and new faces, new names. So I have to uh, let you know right up front a warning and that warning simply is this. There are no predictions here. I am not looking in a crystal ball and giving you ideas about what's going to emerge from this pandemic. And folks, I hate to tell you, if that's why you came here, um, <laughs> I should, should let you know right up front, you're going to be disappointed. I am not looking forward. I'm not a, really a futurist. I am more a um, person who looks in, in, in the past. And what I'm looking for are patterns, patterns of behavior, patterns of organizations, patterns of economies. What are the patterns that are happening and have already happened so that we can learn uh, going forward? We can prepare ourselves to be more agile with how we react to things and how we uh, proact to things. So sorry, folks, if you were looking for predictions, uh, there aren't going to be any. When we send out the slides, I will give you a couple of links to some colleagues and friends who are more of the predictive nature and have done some very interesting thinking about how the pandemic will affect our society, how it will affect our educational system, government, uh, our culture, uh, many, many aspects that I'm sure are on your minds, uh, but these people have done some wonderful thinking. Let's instead spend our time now thinking about what has happened because of the pandemic. What can we learn from it going forward? Well, oops. So let's start with this uh, picture. No, that is not my wife. That is not my um, I don't know this woman at all, but she is a, a professional uh, surfboarder. She is a uh, competitive surfboarder. Uh, I don't re recall her name right off the bat. And I want you to think about this question. What is the most creative or resourceful thing you've done because of the pandemic that you would not, you would not have done otherwise? What is the most creative or resourceful thing each one of you have, have done because of the pandemic that you would not have done otherwise? And the reason I show this, this surfboarder is what she has done is taken her surfboard at home because she's quarantined like all of us, and she has placed it in a hammock. And she actually put a fan in front of her to simulate the ocean. And she rocks back and forth and she practices her balance and it's a, it's a creative solution, uh, a creative and novel approach to staying active with her sport uh, while quarantined in her house. So what I'd like all of you to do is if you would type into the chat function of the uh, Zoom webinar, go ahead and type in, if you would, what you think is your most creative thing that you have done. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and monitor the chat. So take a minute, think about what you've done and go ahead and type it into the chat function. Okay. Good, we have a, a yoga 
exercisers, uh, Sophie. Okay, very good. <clears throat> a new academic paper started painting. Very good. Ah, all right. I'm playing bingo online. <laughs> Martin's created a new course on human resilience. Excellent. Cooking with flowers. All right, that's that's something I can honestly say I haven't done before. All right. Uh, Charles, excellent. Teaching your mom how to use FaceTime. Great, great. Zoom cocktail parties. All right, Harold. <laughs> Harold, where's my invitation? <laughs> uh, good. All right, so a lot of you working with your hands. Um, very nice. Cooking and dining. All right, very good. So, so what's, what I read from this is that you're not sitting idly, right? Uh, even if it's popcorn and wine tasting, it's still, you are doing some things probably a bit differently under quarantine, under this restriction uh, than you, you might have otherwise. You were prompted to do things because of this um, pandemic. And, um, and that is kind of an important, that's an important observation that I want you to all make. I want you to reflect around your own behaviors, um, your own um, motivations when this pandemic hit. What did you do and what, were, what stirred you to do it? And why was it different than what you would have done absent the pandemic? So I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen here. Thank you for that. And Yuri, once again, I just wanna make sure you see my slide. Okay, good. So the pandemic, like you, has caused people to get creative, to do things they would not have done otherwise, whether it's an activity or sharing with an elderly parent, how to use technology or cooking with flowers. We all take the time to do things that we wouldn't have done otherwise, and there's lessons in that. And so what is creativity? What does it really mean to be creative? What has the pandemic done to stimulate the, what, what uh, Arthur Kessler calls the act of creation? And the way he defines it uh, roughly is this. Creativity is the sudden collision of two previously unrelated themes. It's when two themes suddenly collide that don't normally belong together. Kessler de describes it more as two planes that intersect. And where the two planes intersect, they uh, create a fold. They create a line of intersection. And it's at that juncture of these two thematic planes where you find creativity. And that act of creation can be nurtured. It can be developed. It can also be stimulated. And the point of this webinar essentially is to look at what the pandemic has done to stimulate the act of creativity in all of us. And what can we learn from it going forward that would make us more adept and agile uh, and more effective in our lives professionally and personally. Here's an example, a couple examples. Uh, now, this, these are perfect examples of the, the creative act. On the left, you see a, an ice cream cone that has been juxtaposed as a microphone. Uh, and those two simple items, the microphone stand and the ice cream cone, don't typically intersect, but they've been brought together to create this clever uh, visual um, that is the, a classic example of the act of creativity. Same with the pacifier, the mustache pacifier. Um, I don't know what kind of parent would actually buy that for their kid, but they must have a good sense of humor, I suppose. Both of these, by the way, were photos I took uh, on a trip. I believe it was in uh, France, actually. I was in Bordeaux, and I saw these in stores. And if you look carefully, you see these kinds of creative things all the time. So anytime you see something that is creative in your mind, try to look for this juxtaposition. Why is it creative? look at and find the two elements that seem to come together and create this new thing that, that caught your attention, that you found novel. Now, let's face it, 
just because you're unique and creative does not mean you are useful. Uh, there are certainly many ways to be creative, completely worthless in terms of having any value. And so the creativity that we are interested in is the more innovative creativity. What I mean by that is creativity that can be implemented and to create an innovation in our world. Creativity is the cognitive process. It's that process that goes on inside your head to generate an idea. Innovation then is taking that creative idea and putting it in practice. And so the two together create useful uh, ideas, useful creativity, and that's what we wanna focus on today. Not just ideas that are wild and exotic, but totally, totally useless. So, you know, I've been studying creativity for many years. Uh, when I authored, co-authored the book, uh, Inside the Box, with my friend and co-author, Dr. Jacob Goldenberg, you know, I learned a, a ton about creativity, and I also became aware of what I didn't know, <laughs> what, what, what gaps I had in terms of my knowledge of creativity. And, and I, I went back and I started to become a uh, call it a student of creativity. I, I read all the classics, all the classic research and literature by the great thinkers uh, starting pretty much in the early part of the, the, the 20th century. Uh, people who studied creativity in animals, who studied creativity in humans, the psychology community and all their contributions about how the mind works. And I continue to study it and I continue to observe it. And there may be people who disagree with me on this, uh, but from the pandemic, as I observe it, I'm noticing at least two types of creativity that continue to stand out. Again, I'm looking for the patterns of creativity. And so one of those types of creativity that emerges quite a bit during a pandemic is what I would call MacGyver creativity. Now, MacGyver, uh, you may recall, was a TV character played by this gentleman here. And MacGyver, I, don't, I forget his profession, he might have been a private investigator or something like that. But he had a knack for coming up with very creative and novel solutions to, to problems, uh, urgent problems. And it was a very popular TV show and, and his uh, popularity has endured today. As, uh, as this idea of a MacGyver idea. What would MacGyver do? And MacGyver creativity is one type of creativity that I want to have you distinguish from another type. Let's look at what MacGyver creativity is. So here are some examples of what I would call MacGyver creativity. Uh, look at the one in the upper right, the the uh, having been in the military, I can tell you that military people, when they're in the field, they get very creative because they have to. And here you see them taking uh, ordinary shovels. Uh, hopefully they, they uh, wash them out very uh, thoroughly before cooking their, their morning breakfast uh, eggs on them. Uh, and the other solutions are what we call sort of in the moment MacGyver solutions they are solutions because they are using elements right nearby, right available to them. And this is what MacGyver was known for, taking things that he had at his ready, at his disposal to create solutions. If you look at the photo in the lower left, you see a man walking with um, what are, uh, appear to be boots those, that scene is actually from a MacGyver episode. And that is MacGyver, and he has taken duct tape, everyday uh, tape, heavy duty tape, and wrapped it around his feet with some cardboard to create boots. Uh, and I found this, this image on the internet, and it's obviously a great example of a MacGyver solution. It's a MacGyver type uh, idea. What's also true about MacGyver ideas is that they tend to solve a problem, an immediate problem, something 
happening right now and solving them with something immediately available to us in our surrounding environment. The second type of creativity after MacGyver creativity is simply called new to the world creativity. You know, I tried to think of a really clever name for it, like MacGyver creativity, and I just couldn't come up with anything. Uh, Steve Jobs creativity, uh, Yuri Basha creativity, I don't know what I would call it, but let's just for the moment call it new to the world creativity. This is, this is different than MacGyver creativity. Uh, new with the world creativity is creating those ideas that weren't solving an immediate problem necessarily, but are extremely clever and valuable in, uh, in what they deliver. And so here's a couple of examples. This is a uh, child's bicycle. And you notice something about the rear wheels right away that they are canted slightly, they are angled. And by being angled, they allow the child to stay upright while they're learning to ride a bicycle, effectively like training wheels. But what's clever about this bicycle is that as the child gains their balance and starts going faster, these two wheels start to narrow. The angle automatically adjusts to become uh, at a normal 90 degree angle to the ground, effectively adjusting to the child's speed on the bicycle to help them learn to ride a bike without the training wheels. They essentially go away the, the better the child gets at riding the bike and they recover if the child starts to lose balance. Very creative idea, very clever, um, not a MacGyver idea, not something you would sit there in the moment and just come up with out of your head. It took, this, this one took a little bit more effort to create. This one is a simple one that I love to share. It's a, obviously um, a piece of fruit, an apple, but if you look closely at the label on there, you'll see the familiar barcode for scanning at checkout. And what you might not know is this. <clears throat> when you take this fruit home and you wash it and place it in water, uh, the, that label dissolves and becomes a soap appropriate for washing fruit. Very creative, very novel, very simple, uh, and valuable. Not only does it wash the fruit, but it gets rid of that annoying sticky label that's always a pain to scrape off and, and throw away into the trash. Here is another one. This, of course, is a baby's pacifier. Um, a very clever idea where the, uh, the, the baby's temperature is taken while the baby is uh, using the pacifier. Um, not exactly a MacGyver solution, but very creative nonetheless. It wasn't one of those sort of in the moment solutions, but no, no doubt that it has a lot of value because parents are always worried about their kids' temperature, their kids' health, and this is a wonderful uh, example. Now, what's true though is they can overlap uh, you will see ideas that are what I call purely MacGyver. You will certainly see ideas that are purely new to the world. But I, I have found many examples where it's less obvious which one they are. They, they kind of exist in the middle somehow. They, they overlap. So, for example, you look at this clever solution. I uh, uh, understand that this is used in Australia or New Zealand, uh, especially for off-road situ situations. It's a little bit of a new solution, but it's very MacGyver-like in that it's using the exhaust uh, of the car to jack up the car so you can change the tire. And so my point to all of you with us today is I want you to be more observant of creative ideas. Anytime you think you see something creative, uh, don't, don't second guess yourself. Let it land on you and acknowledge that it's something creative. It caught your attention for a reason. And then see if you can figure out, number one, why is it creative? 
what two elements have come together in a sudden way that made this a creative? And then take it a step further. What kind of creativity is it? Is it more of that MacGyver solution? Or is it more of the new to the world solution? Or is it somewhere in the middle? <laughs> if you can't figure it out, it's probably something uh, in the middle. You know, we, we are um, an, an amazing species in our ability to uh, create. We are able to generate solutions because we are a, a species that values survival. Um, and we are able to, to do marvelous things, but we can learn from that natural instinctive thing that we do <clears throat> and do it less instinctive and more proactively, which to me is a, a wonderful skill to acquire. So let's go back to the pandemic. Um, what are the things that we are seeing during a pandemic? What has this shock to the system uh, caused? What's emerged, so to speak? Uh, and I'm like you, I'm sure, uh, I have to admit I'm flooded with the news and overwhelmed by all the stories and um, some closer to home, some related to, to uh, my university, some to the state of Ohio, of course, globally, this is affecting all of us, whether it's uh, uh, in Italy, I noticed our friend Filippo is with us today, or it's in Argentina, or it's in China, it doesn't matter. We're all <clears throat> experiencing this, and we wanna use this opportunity to just take note, what's, what's emerging? And so I, I like to catch it in three principles. Uh, and these principles are uh, essential to the creative act, to understanding how creativity happens, um, the context in which it happens, and we are definitely seeing these three principles in the pandemic. The pandemic has almost uh, forced up these principles to, to rear their heads for us to observe. And let me cover what these three principles are. The first principle, the principle of constraints. Uh, the principle of constraints says that virtually all creative ideas happen under conditions of constraints. That it's almost impossible to think of a truly new idea absent any constraints. And this is why the notion of thinking outside the box is, is wrong headed, right? You just, if you get in an unconstrained context or scenario, your mind tends to be overwhelmed. And what happens, it, it, all research have noticed is that the mind works harder and it works smarter under conditions of constraints. The principle of constraints is something that, that essentially forces us to be creative. And it's going to force both kinds of ideas, especially MacGyver ideas, as, as you'll see in just a minute. The second principle is called the principle of fixedness. Fixedness is an important condition that all humans have. Fixedness is a cognitive bias, a, a, a way that helps us understand the world. It's a fixed frame of how our world works. We have fixedness about how an object performs. We have fixedness about how things are structured. We have fixedness about how things relate to each other. And fixedness is extremely valuable in terms of how you organize your life. But fixedness is also the barrier to creative thinking. And so when you want to be creative, you have to find your fixedness, acknowledge it, and be willing to break it. If you can break fixedness, you are going to yield a creative solution. So know that fixedness isn't something you can get rid of or even want, would want to get rid of. It's not. But when you want to be creative, it is what is standing in your way. So you have to be aware of it and I'll show you some ex examples uh, in a minute. And the final principle is one that, if you've heard me speak at the Global Forum or other venues, you know about this one, the closed world principle. 
the closed world principle states the following, that when generating a solution or solving a problem, one should strive to use resources in your immediate vicinity uh, rather than going far away to import a solution. And what it means, the, 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 the uh, upshot of that is this, the further away you have to go to get a solution to your problem, the less creative it's going to be. The closer your solution is to your problem, the more creative it's going to be. There's an inverse relationship between the proximity of a problem and its solution and its level of creativity. It's a surprising um, principle, and yet when you think about it, this principle could also be called the MacGyver principle. Essentially, it's what causes MacGyver type ideas when you use something in the immediate vicinity. But in my study of creativity and practice of creativity, this principle is perhaps the most important. It's the one that really helps us understand our context and I'll give some examples of it in a minute. Let's first start by looking at the principle of constraints. Well, <laughs> one thing that pandemic has done, of course, has made us uh, think about what we're, what, what, how are we constrained? Uh, let's talk about toilet paper. I'm sure you didn't get on this webinar only to find out that we're going to talk about such a personal uh, factor, a hygiene factor, but I'm a, I, I, I have to laugh about it like I'm sure everyone else is. You know, when the pandemic hit uh, right away, at least in the U.S., people started hoarding toilet paper. And what's happened many times in our society is that the, the notion of scarcity motivates people to want an object. Uh, the principle of scarcity, a well-known persuasion principle. Uh, and in fact, what happens is the notion of scarcity causes an actual scarcity. People who were worried about toilet paper and not having enough, so they went out and bought toilet paper. And what happened? <laughs> There's a shortage. Uh, and it was not just toilet paper. It happened, started to happen with other things like paper towels and hand sanitizer and then it became other things like hair color for women. I, I noticed Tony Russell on the line, formerly with L'Oreal. I'm sure he was uh, t taking note of that one. Women's hair color was going in short supply. And, and so what I'd ask you to do is think about your own behavior. When you notice something going in short supply, like all humans, you probably took count of how much toilet paper you had uh, you probably started to think about, oh my God, what would I do if I ran out of toilet paper? And my point is, we did it individually, but what, what you have to be amazed at is how this worldwide problem got such attention and became such an important issue for, for so many people in just the blink of an eye. Um, the principle of constraints can motivate entire societies uh, to, to think differently, to do things differently, to, to start to act aggressively and creatively. And if you search on Google for what could replace toilet paper, you will see that there is a flood, I mean, thousands, really millions of hits of people thinking about this problem. And it, it's, it just it staggers me. It staggers the mind how we can compel people to think so creatively about something as simple as toilet paper uh, with the principle of constraints, the very powerful motivating force. And so when you look at the principle of constraints, especially when you look in say uh, third world uh, underdeveloped countries, um, you find that like Cuba, for example, the People in Cuba are extremely creative. Uh, you can really spend a lot of time just uh, Googling uh, creativity in Cuba and you will be treated to many types of uh, creative solutions, what I would call MacGyver 
creativity. Here's another one. I think this is from uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken. And again, a, a very creative solution, <laughs> a juxtaposition, right? A clear juxtaposition of two unrelated themes, the cabin of a truck now sitting on top of a, an oxen cart. Uh, again, more creative uh, MacGyver uh, type creativity, but again, stimulated by the principle of constraints and especially in resource constrained environments, um, that, that is a, a natural hotbed for the conditions of constraints and people become extremely uh, creative in those situations. Now here are some examples. These are um, taken from prisoners that are locked up in, uh, here in the US anyway. These were uh, confiscated. This was contraband uh, taken from prisoners. Think about prisoners, right? Talk about the ultimate constraint. You have lost your freedom. Uh, you have lost access to many solutions. And so uh, prisoners in jail are notorious for coming up with extremely creative solutions, sometimes very, very dangerous, like the shotgun. You see the chessboard pieces that, that are carved out of soap and placed on a uh, cardboard box as the chess board. Uh, the tattoo gun, the hot plate. Again, this is more MacGyver type creativity but very much stimulated by the principle of constraints. And, you know, I think when we look at leadership development, we think about our own behaviors. How do you harness this massively powerful principle of constraints? How do you put people under the right conditions of constraints to give them this creative uh, urge? That to me is uh, becoming massively evident during the pandemic, it's causing people to, to come up with all types of creative solutions in virtually every aspect of our, our life. Now let me move to the principle of uh, fixedness. The principle of fixedness, I described it before as this uh, cognitive uh, bias. Um, when you hear the term bias, you may think of it in a negative way, but I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think of it as a negative. It's just a personality. It's a. It's a characteristic of human, our human nature, uh, and it was discovered by a um, researcher named Carl Dunker. Dunker was a uh, researcher from Austria, a psychology uh, researcher, and he did a, a famous experiment that I'm sure some of you have heard of or may recall. And let me share that experiment with you. What Dunker did is the following. He would bring people into a room and on a table, you would see the following three items, a candle, thumbtacks, and a box of uh, matches. A candle, thumbtacks, and a box of matches. And the assignment was that using only these objects, they had to figure out a way to mount the candle to the wall so that it could be lit with uh, the matches. And they had approximately 15 minutes, I believe, to come up with this, uh, come up with a solution. And I've done this experiment with many people. I, I could do it with all of you now, but let me just share some of the things that people typically say here. Many people will say, well, you can melt wax from the candle and place it down the side and attach the candle to the wall. Some people will say you could somehow tack, use the thumbtacks to create a little ledge underneath the candle or perhaps just tack the wick of the candle to the wall to hold it there. Uh, and it, it is a uh, um, a challenging problem, all kinds of ideas come up. Uh, but then another group of participants in the second arm of the study are asked to do the same task, but when they walk into the room, they are confronted with these same elements, but displayed this way. And it's a little hard to 
see that the fact that the candle is still up here, it's the candle, it's the thumbtacks, but now the matches have been taken outside of their box and the box and the matches are laying on top of the table. And when people see the same elements this way, they're immediately able to come up with this solution. Like well over 85% of the people see this solution. Yet in the first arm of the study, less than 15% of people see the box as a solution to this problem. And it caused Dunker to coin the phrase functional fixedness. Fixedness in a functional sense means it's really, really hard for us to imagine a component doing a job other than what it was intended to do. Um, and that's only one type of fixedness. There are others. Uh, and if you're able to break fixedness, and this is where MacGyver was so successful, he was able to see components in a different function than their normal function. And he did it so fluidly. He was able to naturally break fixedness, usually under conditions of constraints, right? He was in some sort of difficult challenge and some dramatic scene. And all of a sudden he figured out how to take duct tape and create uh, a footwear to be able to walk across uh, the rocks. And so MacGyver creativity is um, especially uh, comes out of the ability to break functional fixedness, but so does so does uh, new to the world creativity. Think back to the examples I shared with you with the apple and the uh, sticky label, the wash label. There's an example of functional fixedness. The label now has the additional job of not only being a barcode for checkout but it also creates soap for washing the fruit. A classic example of a creative solution using um, uh, breaking functional fixedness. So be aware of your fixedness. Um, you're not going to get rid of it. You need to be aware of it so that you can recognize it and break it when you are under uh, conditions of, of constraints or any time you wanna be creative, constraints or otherwise. So I'm going to just briefly pause for a minute and ask um, Darla or Yuri, are, are you tracking any of the uh, Q&A at this point? Have, have we uh, gotten any, any questions that we want to field at this point? So far, we don't have any open questions. I do want to feel free to anyone at any time through this webinar. If you do have a question, feel free to drop it into our Q&A. Right now, we don't have any. Okay, good. All right, then I'm going to keep uh, going here. And um, I, uh, I have to share this uh, video because it just, um, I'm sure some of you have seen it before. Uh, you may need to turn up your volume a little bit. Uh, here we go. Fall, and it just, it'd be an exercise and building and stuff between one another. So Harrison, if you don't mind going first, uh, step up here on this chair and close your eyes. All right, and then everybody fill in, and we're going to ask you to fall, and then they will catch you. So you have to trust us. I'm going to count to three. Just relax and fall, okay? One, two, three. No, 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 no. Fall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I now, I want you to know there's no truth to the rumor that we're going to do that at the Global Forum next year in Boston. No truth to that rumor. I understand Michelino was spreading that around that we were going to do that exercise, and no, it's not true. Uh, <laughs> okay, fixedness, right? Uh, fall back, not forward. Now, let me review this last principle, the closed world principle, uh, because I mentioned earlier that I consider this perhaps the most powerful uh, of, the, of the creativity principles that I've discussed. And, and there are some other principles I'm not going to discuss today. But this one in a, in a pandemic becomes apparent all the time to me. And it's one that I've learned to uh, embrace uh, 
a lot because it just leads me to much better solutions, much better thinking when I adopt closed world thinking. And I'll share an, a story as well as sh show you some examples of it. What the closed world is, let's talk about what it is. I described the principle and what it means, but I didn't tell you what it, exactly it is. Think of the closed world as an imaginary boundary around the problem. It's, a, it's an imaginary zone, an area. It can be a physical area, it can be a virtual area, it can be an imaginary area, it doesn't matter. And you get to create it. You get to imagine that closed, bounded area. You can make it very small. In fact, you can make it very tiny. You can make it very large, or you can make it somewhere in the middle. But once you define that closed world, your thinking then should say, my goal is to create with any, everything I have available to, available to me within this bounded area. In other words, you are self-imposing a constraint of the, we call it inside the box. You're putting yourself in a bounded area to give yourself the advantage to be able to come up with a creative solution. Let me share some examples of closed world thinking visually, and then I'll tell you a powerful personal story I had uh, with, a, uh, with a company. I like this uh, one. It's, a, it's visually such an interesting um, example. Take a look at this picture, and <laughs> What you see is, seems almost uh, remarkable or impossible. How could this faucet that's large and not attached to anything be gushing out water into this uh, swimming pool or into this fountain? And what you probably or, uh, may or may not recognize is the way this is done is as follows. If you look in the, in the middle of this, uh, I'm going to try to use my pen function here. Um, if you look in the center here, and Darla, just nod your head if that's if you're seeing that uh, circle. Yeah, good. In here is a is a water pipe, and this pipe comes up from a pump down below and pumps water up into this uh, thing that looks like a faucet, and then of course the water comes rushing back down enough to hide the, pup, uh, the pipe. You don't see the pipe and it creates a very nice illusion. Um, to me, this is an example of closed world thinking because the closed world was just, let's call it this area here, the, the pool and everything related to it. And the designer of this clever illusion was able to harness this pipe as a component now to do this clever job of not just pumping water up like a traditional fountain would, but also injecting it into this uh, thing like that looks like a faucet and creating the illusion. Very simple, very nice. Uh, you, if you see something that you think is designed very cleverly, you'll notice closed world thinking, that the designer has somehow harnessed some element of the closed world to become now useful, a useful visual element or tactile element or some sort of functional element. This is a, a music store. Uh, and the music store has this, this uh, security gate that it closes at night. And the, the gate just happens to look like the front of a Fender guitar amplifier. Uh, I happen to have a model very similar to this one, but, <laughs> but it's, it's a nice illusion that um, is harnessing the closed world of the music store, of the, of the block that it's on here. And so once you define the closed world, your mind should shift immediately to, okay, what components are at my immediate disposal for me to use in some creative way? Of course, people become creative in the moment. Um, certainly somewhat of a MacGyver type solution here. The closed world, where can I get a, a quick nap? This one 
is an astounding example of the closed world. What you see here is a subway platform in Korea. Uh, I know this is Korea because this is Korean language up here. And I've had many participants in my courses and classes uh, that actually know where this subway station is in Korea. But anyway, you see a gentleman getting on here on the subway car. And what you see on the, on the walls here is a, um, a, a graphic display of the shelves of a grocery store. And what happens is a commuter, like this gentleman here, scan the items that they are interested in with their phone. That list then is texted to and paid for to their local grocery store, and they pick up their groceries on the way home from work. Very much a, a, a new to the world solution, very much a closed world solution. And the question I wanna ask you is, what is the closed world here? How would you define it? Well, it's a grocery store, but in this case, instead of the closed world just being the store itself, they have defined it differently. The closed world in this example would be all the elements of the commute between work and home. And that closed world then, out of that clear definition, emerges opportunities like the subway station to become a point of sale or a point of advertisement or harnessed in some creative way to further the business. I just love this example. Now, before I move on, I wanna share a story that uh, I tell quite a bit because I think it so well demonstrates this. And it was a story that was actually with a global forum uh, member, a member of the um, uh, forum for many years, it's a pharmaceutical company, uh, and I won't mention the name, but this particular company was interested in having me help them with uh, a business problem. They were trying to figure out how to increase the sales of their uh, diabetes drug. They have a diabetes drug for type two diabetes, and they were just having a real tough time selling it in uh, China. And so whenever a team tells me they're struggling or whenever somebody tells me in their life that they're struggling, I immediately think closed world. And because over and over, I find that when somebody is struggling with the solution to a problem, they haven't done it. They haven't defined the closed world. They're not even thinking about that. Or they have a team of people and everybody has a slightly different version of what the closed world should be. So imagine you work for a grocery store and one person, the manager, is thinking in terms of the store as being the closed world. But another person is thinking about the, the, uh, the bakery in the store. Another person is thinking about the commute from work to home. Because everybody's out of alignment on the closed world, they're gonna struggle. They're gonna really have a difficult time trying to figure out solutions. So let me tell you what happened with this pharmaceutical company. I asked them, I said, what's the problem? And they, they said, well, we're just overwhelmed, Drew. We just can't seem to figure out how to crack this problem. And I said, okay, why don't we do this? Why don't we, instead of all of China, why don't we just pick one city in China? Just, you know, let's start there. And they said, well, okay, they, they said Shanghai. <laughs> And I said, well, Shanghai, okay, 27 million people. Uh, that, that's a pretty big, pretty big city. I said, guys, come on, why don't we think about a city maybe smaller, maybe one to two million people, about the size of where I live here in Cincinnati. And so they, they kind of shrugged their shoulders and they said, okay, Drew. And they got out a map of China and we looked and we found this uh, town, I forget the name of it, the city, about two million people right in the center interior of China. And I, I said to them, now look guys, let's, we're gonna take this even further. I not only wanna start here in this city, but I want us to imagine going, let's say 30 kilometers outside of the city. Let's go out to a suburb of the city. 
a small suburb that's maybe 20,000 people. And boy, now they're scratching their head. They are really confused. They're thinking I've, I've uh, lost my mind or something. And I said, just hang in there, just hang in there with me. And they said, okay, here's the small suburb of this city, about 20,000 people. And I said, guys, we're gonna push it even further. I want you to imagine just one neighborhood, just one neighborhood in this, uh, in this small town. Boy, they're, they're scratching their heads. I said, okay, we're imagine we're just in one neighborhood. And I said, now I want you to imagine you're on just one street on that neighborhood. Just one street. And they said, okay. And I said, now I want you to imagine just one home on that street with one man, age 50, with type 2 diabetes. You got it? And they said, okay. And I said, now look, you and your team sit down right now and you figure out and explain to me how you're gonna get your drug from where it's made in the US into that man's body every day at the right dose. Just for him, no one else. Because guys, if you can't do it for him, just one man, what makes you think you're gonna be able to do it for all of China? And there was a long pause and they looked at me and I said, get to work and figure it out. And when you figure out all the logistics and supply chain and all the import issues and refrigeration and needle disposal and pharmacy relationships and everything it takes to get it into that man's body, then I'll let you go to another house on that street with somebody else with type two diabetes and figure it out for that person too. And when you get that nice and stable, then we'll go to another street in that neighborhood and figure it out for, for more streets. And then we'll go, once we're done with that neighborhood, we'll figure out how to get the drug into another neighborhood nearby. And then we'll go from another neighborhood to eventually another city. And then ultimately to the rest of China. And so it was a profound story for me and for the team. They immediately started to figure out the solution. And it taught me the valuable lesson that many times our closed world boils down to just one person. Figure it out for an N of one. I know the jobs that many of you do. Chantel sent me the list of participants today. And I, I know that you deal with uh, leadership programs and you deal with uh, developmental issues. I look at our friend Lil Lily Sapp from uh, FEMA here in the US. You know, Lily, I think about your challenges in terms of how you train FEMA executives. And what I would tell you is the closed world principle should make you think about one leader at a time. Figure it out for one and then expand, develop your closed world out from there. You will generate more successful ideas. You will generate more creative ideas by embracing the closed world principle. So we're at uh, 10 o'clock uh, my time locally. We've been at it for about an hour. I'm going to spend a few more minutes and then I'm going to leave ample time for questions uh, here at the end. We'll probably end a little early, but I want to thank uh, the uh, team from the Global Forum again for inviting me today. I know they have some other exciting programs set for you later that uh, Michelena, I believe, is going to tell us about at the end here. So let me finish and talk to you a little bit about what is the pandemic teaching us? What can you learn from the pandemic? Well, you should all expect to be constrained. If you're like me living here in Ohio in the US, uh, the governor has been quite clear that we are quarantined or at home. We have restrictions on number of people we can be with. Um, we're, we're, we're living under constraints. And when you are constrained, you, I want you to observe your own behavior and the behavior of others. And then think about once the pandemic is over, how can you still harness that very important feeling that people have? How do they become so creative all of a sudden 
and how can you replicate a pandemic? <laughs> Never thought I'd say that, but you're replicating the conditions of constraints to yield that same kind of motivation people have to be creative. When you are in a world of constraints, also be, be careful to uh, and thorough in defining the closed world. Let me go back to the very first example of the professional surfboarder, the woman who used her surfboard on a hammock. And she figured out in, in the closed world of her living room how to take this hammock and turn it into a training tool, very much um, a creative MacGyver type solution. Not only do you want to define the closed world, but it's essential that you and your team are aligned around what it is. Make sure they're absolutely clear. And uh, it can be whatever you want, but everybody has to be on the same page. They have to be in the same mental space, imaginary space to make progress with your problem. You want to make sure that you recognize the, the resources within the closed world. And most importantly, you wanna understand and be ready to break fixing this. Go into any creative situation knowing you have fixed this, which is a good thing, but your goal essentially is to, is to figure out ways to break that fixing this, to see solutions you might not have seen otherwise, to see components doing things that uh, they hadn't done before, and now you can harness them to generate new solutions, new possibilities, both MacGyver-like as well as new to the world. So I want to leave you with a short story here, uh, why I think it's so important to break fixing this. Um, some poor driver, unfortunately, wasn't paying attention and managed to uh, drive their car, which you see submerged here, uh, into, um, into the water. And um, you see the owner, the owner is standing right here. And so, of course, the natural solution is to hire a, a company to come and fish out the car. And so they called the local uh, towing company. This is somewhere in the uh, United Kingdom. And so things are going uh, very well. They're getting the car towed out of the water. The job is nearly done. The owner is uh, about to be reunited with his vehicle. And then suddenly, something unexpected happens. Uh, something that they didn't plan on, the uh, weight ratio and the geometry of the, um, the task to pull the car out of the water overcame <laughs> the, the physics and pulled the whole darn tow truck back into the water with the car. So what do you do? in this situation? Well, the normal way people think is simple. You have this problem, you bring in a bigger tow truck and you get the car out with the bigger tow truck. And of course, you then decide to pull out the original tow truck that fell into the water after you get the car to shore and things are going very well to get this tow truck out and funny thing happens, what do you know? It gets pulled into the water as well. Ah, but the story is not over. There is yet one more option available to them. And what do you think it was? Was it a creative solution? No, <laughs> let's get a bigger tow truck. And it's a fascinating true story of how we tend to solve our problems. We tend to solve them with what we call the ER ideas. You know those words that in English that end with the letters ER, like bigger and faster and stronger and cheaper, right? We, we use these words as potential solutions to our problems. They're, and I would tell you, they're not creative they are not always effective. They're, they might be effective, but, but what's true is that just generating ER ideas 
is a classic example of fixedness. And what do you think happened with this larger tow truck? <laughs> well, that's the end of the story. We'll let them off the hook here. Uh, and, and, and I want to finish with just a, a personal um, uh, view about my long association with the Global Forum now before I turn it back over to uh, the team. You know, the Global Forum was introduced to me, I believe it was 2002, and I was at the, uh, the program in Amsterdam. And as I look at the list of people here, I know Oka, Oka is here, uh, and uh, Reinholdsen, and I know Chantel, of course, and people like Filippo was probably there, and Harold, and uh, lots of you were at that Global Forum. And for me, it was the very first time. And, you know, I, I didn't realize what I was getting myself into. I was getting myself into a long-term relationship with a lot of wonderful and very smart people and very supportive people that have taken this, uh, this uh, marketing guy <laughs> and, and welcomed me into this very important community of practice. And I, you know, folks, at my core, I'm a teacher. I love, I love being with uh, people of all ages little kids now, whether they're 10 years old or late in their careers, it doesn't matter. I've learned so much from the Global Forum because it really is a community um, of, of how uh, action learning is practiced, how we move people along, how we get them to, to improve their professional development, their networking with others. And, you know, it really is about thinking differently. Uh, next year at the Global Forum, I, you heard Yuri talk about how we're going to be more future thinking, looking and thinking differently about the future because it's as essential that we learn at a rate faster than the rate of change. And this more than anything has been the gift uh, to me that my uh, good friend and mentor Yuri has, uh, has imparted on me. And I, I really embrace it as, as a life lesson. And so thank you again for being here today. I wish you well, stay well. And uh, look forward to seeing you in, in Boston next June. So may the next few months be a period of magnificent transformation. Now this one's anonymous. My first quote was unknown. And, and to be honest with you, I don't know the difference between when they say the quote is unknown versus anonymous. But anyway, I think it's still an appropriate quote. And I truly wish it for all of, all of us here at the Global Forum. All right, Yuri, Michelena, I will turn it over to you. Yuri, I think you're still on mute. Yuri, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm okay now. That okay, good. Took me off mute there. Good. Thanks for this very inspiring session, Drew. And uh, we look forward to a continuation of that discussion of the Global Forum. But also, too, I wanted to thank uh, Darla, uh, who did an excellent uh, job. It's, the virtual skilled executive assistant who's doing wonderful things and also has a very deep knowledge and experience with virtual platforms. Thank you very much, Drew. Well, as we all know, Drew is himself very creative. He, in fact, makes custom-made guitars on the side as a hobby. And he's also writing a new book. So we are the, one of the very first people in the world to know that he's writing a book, and it's entitled Adding Prestige to Your Portfolio, how to use the creative luxury process to develop products everyone wants. Now, what that looks like a bestseller to me again, Drew. So I'm hoping you'll discuss this with us in Boston as well. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Michelena, who is the coordinator of the Valid series. And before, <laughs> and before I do that, uh, my final words to you this, this, uh, this morning or evening is uh, to thank you for being with us. Yeah, And uh, to use the words of this wonderful advertising that you well know, Drew, from the most interesting man in the world, <laughs> stay safe and thirsty, my friend. Thank you. Michelina, it's all yours. Perfect. So, uh, so thank you so much, uh, Yuri. And um, thank you so much to Drew and Darla uh, Wilkinson, who's just provided tremendous support and uh, to both technical, logistical, uh, emotional, and, and sometimes as well. Uh, you know, many thanks to, to you and uh, for those of you that have participated for just a really great start to 
our Global Forum Ballot Series. I know that this, we're engaging in a way that we don't typically do. Typically, we are interacting face-to-face -face and uh, uh, our, our hope, our aspiration is that this is a way for us to remain connected, continuing in that uh, environment of, of learning and engagement that will help bridge us through uh, to when we see you in the Boston Cambridge area in June 2021. So, uh, Ms. Lena, could I interrupt? I, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't realize that we have a couple of questions in the Q&A and in the in the chat and we we have just a couple minutes if you would like me to answer those. Uh, sure, if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, they're from, uh, one's from Dan and one's from Tony. I just pulled them up now, I apologize, we, before we uh, closed out here. Um, and then there's a one in the chat as well. Uh, this one, interesting one from Andreas Fritz, he, he says, uh, what was your most creative thing you have done, Drew? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a uh, oh, very open-ended question. I, you know, I, I'm, I have uh, seven patents but I don't consider patents necessarily um, evidence of creativity. Uh, I think the, what's the most creative thing I've done? Boy, you stumped me, Andreas, with that question. I'm gonna have to think about that a little longer. Uh, not that I do you know, amazingly creative things all the time. It's just to look, to look for one. I, I will tell you that I like to look at old creative, um, old innovations and consider you know, their level of creativity. And I will tell you, I consider this the most creative thing, one of the, maybe the most important and creative thing that humans have ever devised. And they, it gets so little credit, you know, eyeglasses. But most of the world has eye vision problems. And with, with visual problems, we can't read, we can't drive. Can you imagine how different the world would be if we didn't have uh, vision correction as a, as a solution? So. Now the question from Dan Nor um, Norenberg, Dan, thank you. Drew, how would you recommend helping leadership teams become more creative and developing a more creative organized culture? Yeah, Dan, it's a, that's, that's really a, a pressing question for all of us. And I think it's embracing these three principles, incredibly important constraints, closed world. And I, I think most importantly is that leaders have to understand that see creativity as a skill. You know, don't, don't embrace it as a gift. Don't relegate it to just special people in their organization. The minute they do that, they, uh, they cut themselves off from, you know, many um, opportunities. And Tony Russell, last question here, Michelina, and we'll, we'll call it quits. Tony asked, um, I wonder why the world was so panicked by the obvious short of, of protective masks when there were very simple opportunities for very simple MacGyver solutions here. What happened? Yeah, you know, um, I found myself looking for protective masks. As it turns out, I had a, a small supply of them in my, my workshop because I do a lot of sanding, um, woodworking, guitar work. Um, but there were so many solutions. Uh, and I, I, think, I think what uh, causes a lot of panic, to be honest with you, is the media. You know, we're, we, we always see one side of things without seeing the other side of things. And, and um, so, you know, talk about a leadership lesson. This, this probably too can be formulated into a, a, a lesson for leaders. Um, why were we able to be panicked with one side of the story when there was another side that looked at uh, a, a broader spectrum, maybe a closed world, thinking would have opened us up to um, more MacGyver type solutions. It's a great question, Tony. I'm gonna to give it some more thought. I'm drilling down into the, the real pearls now of what the pandemic is uh, bringing to us. So thank you for those questions. Michelin, again, I apologize. I just, I saw those, but especially for Dan and uh, Tony, I couldn't, couldn't resist to uh, answer their questions. So back to you. No, no, thank you so much. And you know, I think that we are fortunate to be in a community of friends, uh, friends like family. And so uh, you know, true, true. <laughs> to, to make that connection. So, um, so just uh, very, very quickly, uh, as we're wrapping up here, I uh, just wanted to say to everyone, thank you again. And to please be sure to check your emails for 
the or the Global Forum website for information about our upcoming presentations. For example, our next two, next Thursday, about this same time, we'll have Thomas Carlson, President and CEO of NCC, who will speak on turnarounds and transformations, a CEO's lessons in uh, critical times. So he'll share lessons from his experience leading companies through difficult times. And then in June, on Thursday, June 18th, Dr. Marilee Adams will lead a session entitled Change Your Questions, Change Your Questions, Change Our Future, How the Right Kinds of Questions Are Our Best Hope for Leading and Learning and Transformation. Um, and Marilee is gonna be joined by two of her colleagues to talk about how leading and learning with questions offer the best hope for our future. Um, and then just finally, the, uh, a reminder, this session has been recorded. And so everyone that registered for the registered for this session will receive a link as well as Drew's slides. And um, within that link that you will receive, there will be a very, 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 very brief survey. It's three questions that should take about five minutes uh, longer if you wanna spend more time in the open and did box uh, uh, sharing your thoughts and feedback. But um, we really would appreciate your feedback. Um, you know, as Drew started off saying that, um, you know, during this pandemic, we're doing and going through things that, uh, doing things in a way that um, we haven't before, uh, doing things that we wouldn't have thought to do otherwise, and organizing these ballads has really been the, the, the nudge, the, the impetus for us to think about uh, organizing these sessions to keep our Global Forum community engaged. So to the extent that we get your thoughtful feedback on both th this session, uh, our format in general, just your, your feedback and comments are, are very much welcome. And as so, um, as you can imagine, uh, there are lots of folks who are uh, involved in helping to organize and uh, certainly familiar faces, uh, uh, Chantal, Carl, uh, Yuri, and then we've had the, the pleasure of working with Darla. Uh, so all of whom have um, uh, looked to launch this uh, series of presentations with you. So thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you at a future ballad. Again, check the website, check your email. We'll be sending something out shortly. So thank you so much, and have a great day. Bye-bye.